Many people are considered heroes who have helped end segregation. You've heard of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., but you probably haven't considered Louis Armstrong, Fletcher Henderson, or even Betty Goodman as people who have helped break down the color barrier. Jazz is an all-American form of music. Jazz, like America, is a mix of cultures. And also like America, it was modern and progressive. My name is Daniel Glass. I am a drummer, author, and educator. For much of the last 20 years, I've played with a band called Royal Crown Review, which is a band that uh, focuses on the swing era. Jazz music originated in the South, in New Orleans. Its roots came from African spirituals and the ragged timing of ragtime. Aside from the swung eighth note, jazz gets its distinct sound from the call and response nature. This is very similar to the call and response spiritual sung by African American dock workers. Well, I got started way back in the days, I think it was in the early 50s when I got started with music. Uh, at that time, we couldn't have music playing on blues music in the house. We only could play spirituals. Uh, I come from my mom, she had a church down the south, and only thing we could play was spiritual music. We couldn't play no blues at all. Jazz music originated in the African American community. It was performed in New Orleans and on riverboats. Vic Spiderbeck grew up listening to the music on passing riverboats. He ended up emulating the techniques he heard. Although he got his fame for playing jazz with white musicians, he was outraged by segregation. And in the end, he helped introduce the style to a much broader community. Along with the great talent came drinking problems, which killed him by the age of 28. Louis Armstrong is considered by many to be one of the world's greatest trumpet players. He was an entertainer, but Louis Armstrong always entertained the way that he knew how to entertain, and he was very successful at it. Charles Black was instantly an avid fan of Louis Armstrong when he first heard him play. He was raised with racist views, but when he heard Louis play, they seemed to vanish. He played mostly with his eyes closed, letting flow from that inner space of music things that had never existed. He was the first genius I'd ever seen. It is impossible to underestimate the significance of a 16-year-old Southern boy seeing genius for the first time in a black person. We literally never saw a black man in anything but a servant's capacity. Louis opened my eyes wide and put to me a choice. Blacks, the saying went, were all right in their place. But what was the place of such a man and of the people from which he sprung? Charles L. Black. This change of character played an important role when this Yale Law graduate went on to argue before the Supreme Court in one of America's most influential trials, Brown versus the Board of Education. Louis Armstrong was known for his solo work as well as his work with Fletcher Henderson's band. Henderson was revolutionary. He wrote down music rather than relying solely on improv and memorization. He was known for introducing new instruments and techniques to jazz. It was in Fletcher Henderson's band uh, right around 1930 with the drummer Walter Johnson that we first hear a hi-hat being recorded. So that gives you an idea that, of how forward-thinking Fletcher Henderson was, that he wanted to already integrate this new instrument, the hi-hat. And again, by the time you get to the mid-30s, the hi-hat is the dominant instrument for timekeeping. As Harlem's population increased, so did the creativity, talent, and racism. In the 1920s, there was a thing called the Harlem Renaissance, where this suddenly a lot of white people were paying attention to the African-American community up in Harlem, the black area of town, because there was a lot of jazz happening there. And it was very cool and very hip and very chic to be into jazz. If you were on the cutting edge of what was cool, that's where you would go at that time. The Cotton Club was opened in Harlem to showcase the spectacle known as jazz. The Cotton Club was um, a big um, supper club, a fancy supper club up in Harlem in the 1920s. The Cotton Club featured all black performers, but no black customers. The truly ironic thing about the entire thing was that even though it was a black staff and a black entertainment in a black neighborhood, no blacks were allowed in as patrons. 
<laughs> it was for whites only, even though it was smack dab in the middle of Harlem. Well, it was a fancy place. Everybody dressed up, tuxedos and evening formal wear. Um, it, uh, I remember reading something about, you know, the menu. They had an extensive menu, so it was uh, certainly not a place that uh, a middle-class person could afford to go to, or not very often. It was definitely for more of a high society kind of a thing. But, you know, the bands, they, they did these wild shows that sort of today we might think is very stereotypic. They were, you know, jungle drums and jungle beats. That was a whole big thing that was very chic at that time. You know, Josephine Baker was a beautiful dancer, and she would sometimes dance very scantily clad, and it was salacious. It was kind of all these things uh, about the jazz age and the Roaring Twenties, um, and jazz in general, that was titillating, it was exciting for people. It was somewhat risque, it was somewhat, um, you know, to go up to Harlem, to the black neighborhood, and go experience this African-American entertainment, you know, where they you know, it, it played on uh, African-American stereotypes. Benny Goodman, the leader of one of the world's greatest big bands, made one small change that really helped. He was the first to integrate a jazz band. It was not small, it was a really, really, really big deal. So, Benny Goodman finally said, and he started by bringing them in as featured players in his small group. So that was a way that he kind of got around it. He said, all right, well, we, you know, because a lot of the big bands they would have a subset of a quartet or quintet or sextet um, that would come out and do a small group set during the middle of the show. And he was the most popular big band leader of the era, so who was going to say no? Yo, oh, yeah, that was way before Martin Luther King days was, uh, they, uh, they come along way beyond Martin Luther King's days. That was, they was always playing in the white society. John Hammond was a very famous and respected record producer. Like Benny Goodman, Hammond saw musicians for their musical talent, not for the color of their skin. He helped bring jazz from taboo to art. Here in America, you know, with all the racial stuff, there was still a lot of trouble with respect for jazz. Okay, if you want to go drink bathtub gin in a place owned by a gangster, sure, jazz is fine there, but not on our respectable record label. So it took through the 1920s, even though jazz was a fad, you know, it was not yet considered to be respectable music. You wouldn't go see a jazz concert at Carnegie Hall. It took until 1938 for there to be a jazz concert at Carnegie Hall. So John Hammond discovered Billy Holiday, discovered Count Basie. You know, he, that's one of his most famous stories. He went to Kansas City where Count Basie had, was based and, you know, discovered this incredibly swinging band, this band that was playing dance rhythms in a way that nobody else was. Tired of constant racism in clubs like the Cotton Club, Barney Josephson wanted to make a change. He set up Cafe Society in where else? Greenwich Village. Cafe Society was truly an integrated club, and the name was meant to mock society. The Access Theatre Company now occupies the building but the main difference is the theater itself. Although physically the theater looks very different today, the progressive spirit of Cafe Society still lives on. Singers such as Billy Holiday got their start in the Cafe Society. One night, Barney Josephson asked Holiday to sing a song, not just any song, a song that would risk her career. She risked uh, being blacklisted in addition to, you know, um, all of her other personal problems that could have gotten her blacklisted and sometimes did uh, because jazz musicians who used drugs at that time were often denied what was called a cabaret card meaning they could not play in New York City and for a lot of jazz musicians their lifeblood was their gigs here in New York City. The song was titled Strange Fruit. It was about the lynching of two African-American men. She said yes. When the song was performed, it would always close the show. It was always performed with a single light on her, and no one would ever ask for an encore. Blood on the leaves And blood at the root Black bodies swinging In the southern breeze here is a strange and bitter cry. 
jazz didn't end segregation by itself, but it was a crucial part. After jazz lost its popularity, blues continued the trend. Did you ever get kicked out of a white club? Yes, I have got kicked out of a white club at the time, back in the day. They didn't want blues in there, and all they want was country and western. And I was a blues player, and I played a couple of songs and stuff like that, and I really, they, they didn't like it. You know, they thought, well, this is what we do. It's good what we do, but we just don't want black music in here. We don't want blues here. We want this country and western, you know. And so I got kicked out a few clubs doing that back in the day. But as of the day, they accept me as of the day, you know. So it made a difference. <laughs> and that's one thing about music. Music always brings people together. Always. Ever since I've been knowing blues and jazz and gospel and rock and roll, it's bring you, it's, it's, it's pull you together. It's, it's real because you never, you never meet, a, if you're a musician, you never meet a stranger.